want to say thank you for being here, and I'm excited about having the opportunity to share this information with you. This is a workshop that I do uh, around the country uh, that I call Safe Place, Safe Process. And that's based on two very, very important statements that I stand by and that I believe uh, every church ought to understand and embrace, and that is that the church should be a safe place for people to tell their secrets, and the church must have a safe process for people to experience emotional and spiritual healing. Now, we're going to talk about that tonight and tomorrow and in the sessions, and I will explain that a little bit more, and you'll understand that better. I think at the beginning, though, it's probably would be helpful for me to explain to you how I got here and how all of this stuff kind of came together. And I think it will make our time uh, this weekend a lot more productive for you if you understand a little bit of how this happened and it actually happened out of my life. I grew up in West Texas uh, in a tin roof house on a dirt road across the street from the local cemetery in a small West Texas town. Uh, my father was a drunk and my mother is a Jehovah's Witness. So we were kind of the, uh, uh, the epitome of the dysfunctional family, if, if you will. And when I say that my father was a drunk, um, I mean he was a brown bag wino. My dad was the guy uh, that was sitting uh, downtown against the brick building with a brown paper bag between his legs with the top pulled down with a bottle of cheap wine in it just to get drunk. And my mother was a waitress in a truck stop trying to support my sister and I. And uh, at times that was, she was capable of that and at times it, it didn't work out all that way. So from the earliest time of my life, I was on my own. I didn't have supervision. I didn't have anybody you know, watching over me. I went to school when I wanted to. I didn't go when I didn't want to. And it's interesting how regularly I found reasons not to go to school, uh, even as a second or third grader. Um, I, I, you know, growing up in that environment and no supervision, as you can imagine, I was a child of the 60s, began drinking and drugging very early on, in and out of school, dropping in and out of school, eventually in and out of trouble with the law, uh, in and out of jail, all kinds of things. By the time I was almost 18 years old, most of my buddies were kind of gone. Most of the people that I ran with were gone. They were either dead, or they were in jail, or they were in Vietnam, because it was the tail end of the Vietnam era. And into that void at that time in my life, some Christian people in that small community came into my life and loved me. And I wasn't very lovable, I can promise you that. Uh, music was kind of the, the, the bridge. Uh, I'm a musician, I played in a band, I still play, I still sing. Um, and music was kind of that connection point that God used in my life. And, and they began to love me and welcome me into their families. And I was quite hungry for that, because what, what is a family? I, I didn't really have a picture for that. I didn't really know what that looked like. And uh, on New Year's Eve, 1971, bringing in 1972 in Cloudcroft, New Mexico, was when I bowed my heart before Jesus Christ and trusted him as my Lord and Savior. And I had been hanging out with these kids for several months. They had shared with me. They had loved me. They had not really preached to me, but they had shared with me. They were unapologetic about their testimony in Christ. And I looked at their lives, and I looked at my life, and it became quite obvious to me, this one works better than this one. And, and the Lord used that to draw me to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that was the first miracle in my life. It was like a Damascus Road experience. My life turned around. The second miracle was several months later, I graduated from high school. And how in the world that happened, I, st I still marvel because I had been in and out of school but never seemed to lose a grade, always managed to, to you know, stay up. They just, I guess they were relentless about getting me out of school and so they weren't going to let me fail. Well, all these friends were going to college so I thought, well, I'll go to college. I never thought of going to college. I never even thought about getting out of high school, quite frankly. I started off at a small Christian college where if you could get the money to go, you could go to school. And we were so poor, I got grants and loans and I worked two or three jobs and, and I started college. I later transferred to Baylor University in Waco where I eventually graduated in 1976. But my first weekend home from college, from that small Christian college, first homecoming weekend, uh, on a Friday afternoon I got home and my, my father died. He was 41 years old when he died of alcoholism. And when my dad died, he was in a flop house. He didn't have a driver's license, had no ID on his body didn't have a dime in his pocket. He had fallen, hit his head on a little gas spigot that came out of the floor. His kidneys had failed. He was unconscious. Uh, the people found him, took him to the hospital, and he died. I got home about an hour after that, got the phone call that my father had died. I did his funeral. The first funeral that I ever performed was my father's funeral the next morning. And that is because, not because I chose to, but because I was the only son, 
And he did have a Jehovah's Witness background, even though he was disfellowshipped from Jehovah's Witnesses. And so a Jehovah's Witness would not have anything to do with it. Uh, there was nobody else to. And so if anything was going to be done, the family looked at me and said that I would have to do it. And, and I did. And, but I put him in the ground on Saturday. Monday morning, I was back at college. I was back in class. His was a sad, it was a wasted life, but mine wasn't going to be. I was convinced that mine was not going to be. And besides that, I'd been saved. I'd been changed by Jesus. I had a world to win, and man, I was ready to go. Well, when I graduated from Baylor University, I majored in Greek at Baylor University. I went to seminary. I got married. Graduated from seminary in 1981, the first time. And my wife and I moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I took my first pastorate. I was there for three years. We came back here in 1984 to this church. It was just a little startup church, a little mission. Uh, I was the only pastor. I'm the only pastor the church has ever had. January 1 of 1984 to this new church plant. I finished my doctorate in 1988 here at Southwestern Seminary. And as I began to move into my early 30s, I began to move into, I actually really, really began to spiral into a severe, severe depression. And that depression was really the result of two streams coming together in my life that formed a raging river when they came together. And the first stream was a frustration with ministry. I was in a ministry style that I knew did not fit me, that I knew wasn't really what I was cut out for or even what I was called for, but it was the only one I knew. It was the one I had been taught in, in, in college and in seminary. It was the one I had modeled for me, and it was the only one I knew. I knew it didn't fit, but I didn't have an alternative, and I was incredibly frustrated with that. And then the second stream that came together into this river were unresolved childhood emotional issues that I had never dealt with. And those two came together and they formed a raging torrent in my life that quite frankly by the time I was 35 years old nearly killed me. And I'll not go into the gory details of, of the things that went through my mind, but you can imagine what it was like. I lost 30 pounds. I weighed 150 at the time. I got down into the low 120s. Uh, I'm almost six feet tall. And I was a walking skeleton. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I just wanted to die. And I tell people that it's like being in a swimming pool when you've got two arms, but you have three balls that you have to keep submerged. And you're working, and you're working. And you know, when you're younger and you've got energy, you can kind of get that. But after a while, your arms get tired, and, and that ball comes up, and then this one comes up. And, and I just got to the point where I couldn't keep all the balls under the water, and it just wore me out. It got so bad that on a Sunday morning in 1990, we were meeting in a school at the time before we moved on to this property. I looked at the congregation. I was prepared to preach. And I looked at them and I said, you know what? I can't do this today. And I turned around and walked off. I left the church sitting there in the auditorium. I got in my vehicle and I went home. And I went to bed. My wife, my kids, everybody was there. I just left. And as I pulled the covers over my head, I remember thinking, well, James, now you've really stepped in it. Because now not only are you depressed, now you're probably also unemployed. And this is where it gets kind of strange. It really gets strange here because the weird thing about it is I got up Monday morning and I went to the office and started my week and nobody said a word. Nobody said anything about what had happened the morning before. Next week, about 30% of the church just didn't come back. They just, it just freaked them out. And they just didn't come back. And so here I was. I was just kind of, you know, okay, well, I just go through the week. I got up and I preached the next Sunday, but I just preached to a smaller crowd. Nobody came. Nobody said, James, what's going on? Nobody said, well, you know, you're going to be fired. Nobody. It was just like it didn't happen. Nobody said anything at all. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this is what really is part of form of what I'm going to be sharing with you this weekend. The interesting thing about it is that during this time of my life, I was doing the Christian disciplines more than I had ever done them in my entire Christian life. And by the Christian disciplines, I'm talking about scripture memory, prayer, meditation, witnessing, all of the things that we're told as Christians. These are the disciplines that we're to practice and be involved in. And I was doing them, folks. I was, I was praying hours a day. I was getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep. Depressed people don't sleep. That's all they want to do is sleep, but they can't. You're right. And so I was on my face before God, crying out, God, deliver me from this pain. Give me an answer. I was memorizing, folks, books of the Bible. I memorized the entire book of Ephesians, 
Philippians and James, I could quote them to you word for word. I was thinking, okay, if I just take in enough of the word, surely this is going to relieve this pain that I am. But I continued to spiral deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, it is that experience that later caused me to question or rethink what I have come to say is a perversion of the gospel in America. A perver perversion of the gospel, in, particularly in the American church. And it, it, it kind of goes like this. And I don't think anybody says this, but it's kind of the subtext that keeps going around. And that is this, that if you just love Jesus enough, your life is going to be okay. Now, we don't really say that, but that's really kind of the you know, written underneath, it's kind of between the lines. If, you know, if you're having problems in your life, you just need to love Jesus more. And if you just love Jesus enough, then your life is going to be okay. Now, I, I'm telling you, I loved Jesus, okay? <laughs> he changed me. He saved me from probably an early grave, a lifestyle like my dad. I knew that. I never questioned that. He'd given me a wonderful wife, two wonderful children, Every opportunity in the life that a kid coming from where I came from did not deserve. I loved Jesus and I still nearly died. And one of the reasons I believe that the church is not really a safe place in most places in America is because of this false gospel that is the subtext in most churches. That if you just loved Jesus enough, you wouldn't be having those problems. Well, you see, here's the deal. That keeps people from being honest about the struggles and the problems that they really have because they don't want anybody to think in the church they don't love Jesus. And, and the message is, but if you love Jesus, it's going to be okay. And you know your life is not okay. And so you don't want to be telling anybody it's not okay because you don't want them to think you don't love Jesus. And so what we do is we put on our Sunday clothes and our Sunday mask and we, we walk around. God is good all the time. Praise the Lord because we want people to know and to think that we love Jesus. And most of us really do. Now, if someone struggles then, this is typically what happens. We say, well, you know, just love Jesus more. And what does that mean? It means give more, pray more, study more, serve more, memorize more scripture, more, more, more. In other words, do more of the Christian disciplines. That's a typical answer. So when someone's marriage fails, you know, maybe they're a deacon in the church, maybe they're a Sunday school teacher, maybe they're just good folks they have been around there for a while. And all of a sudden, one day, one of them just says, you know, I'm done with this. Everybody in the church says, well, you know, I thought it was so-and-so loved Jesus. Well, I, I, guess they, I guess they didn't. That wouldn't have happened if they loved Jesus. You see, you know what I'm talking about here? You see, our church that I was pastoring was not a safe place for anybody to talk about the pain that I was in, much less the senior pastor. It wouldn't have been safe for anybody. But here I was, the senior pastor, and it certainly wasn't a place that I had the freedom to talk about. And, and if you'll pardon the illustration here, um, it's a little crude, but it kind of communicates. I was kind of like that pile of dog poop in the middle of the floor that everybody ignores, hoping somebody else will clean it up. Yeah. You know, and if you just act like it's not there, well, maybe somebody else will take care of it and you won't have to mess with it. Okay? Well, that's kind of why the, how the church dealt with me. I was this wounded person, obviously not healthy. Nobody wanted to deal with it, so they just went away. And the ones that didn't go away just didn't deal with it. And so we just kind of rocked along. Eventually, within about eight months after that, we did move into this facility on this property. We were, had been building the building. And I had made a commitment that I was going to get the church into this building, and then I was done. You know, we were building this building. I didn't think it was right for me to leave them, you know, in the middle of a building program. So we did that. We moved into the building. Within two weeks, I turned my resignation in. And I said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go get a job try to serve the Lord, try to raise my kids, try to love my wife, but I don't want to be a part of what we're doing anymore. Again, a twist kind of happened at this point because the leadership, I expected them to shout, shout hallelujah, <laughs> we're finally done with him. They didn't do that, but one of them said, why don't you take some time off, James? And they said, why don't you just take 90 days? They called it a sabbatical leave. 90 days. And then at the end of that night, you just do whatever you want to do. Rest, you know, because I had I'd really been burning the candle at both ends. I'd been working on my doctoral uh, project. I'd been building this building and all this. They didn't know about all the other stuff that was going on, on the side, but they knew something was wrong. And they just thought I was worn out, I guess. And, 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 and I knew it was more than that. But they said, why don't you just take some time off, rest, do whatever you want. 
And then if you still feel like you need to resign after that, then we'll accept it. We'll just take care of everything here. And I said, no, I don't think I can do that because, you know, we just moved into this facility. Pastor disappears for three months, but I will take two weeks. I took two weeks. And this is what I told them to do. I said, I'm going to spend the first week at the seminary library uh, because I, I love books. I'm an academic. I love the smell of books. And, uh, and so uh, I'll, I'm going to go to the seminary library for a week and just pray and study. And then I'm going to spend the second week with my family. And in my mind, I was going to come back and reissue my resignation. So I hit the library on Monday morning. And uh, I spent that first week. And, and I started with this, with this thing in mind. I said, Lord, what is the church supposed to be? What is this church supposed to look like? And what do you want me to be? And, and what do you want me to do? Because if you want me to continue to do this, I've got to have something different than what I'm doing. Because, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And, and so what I did is I went and began to get into the Bible and I began to go to the New Testament to look at the church. What did Jesus call the church to be? And what did he intend the church to be? And I tell you, I began to see the, the New Testament church with different eyes. And I, and I say they were eyes of desperation. And I tell people all the time, when you come to the Scripture with eyes of desperation, those are the best eyes. Because they'll strip away a lot of the junk that's clouded the, the reality. I was desperate. I was scratching for survival. And so all of my training, everything I'd been taught, everything I'd done, it was just kind of stripped away. And I just said, Lord, I want to come and I want to see something that is pure. And, and I began to get this picture of, of the body of Jesus that was different from anything that I had ever uh, been a part of. It was like this film began to strip off my mind and, and I, so I just started taking notes and I was reading and I was doing everything. I was there for five straight days. I had piles of notes. And by the end of that week I had this renewal of a sense of passion and vision and I still didn't fully know everything that it was about but I, I knew that God had done something that week. So I went ahead and spent the second week with my family. We went down to SeaWorld. I came back and I turned my resignation in again. And I said to them, guys, God has done something miraculous in my heart over these last two weeks. But what I need to do is I need to go out and start a church and do it right. I don't want to be a part of what we're doing here anymore. And I said, no, wait a minute. What do you mean? And so I said, well, I'll explain it to you if you want me to. And they said, let's do five hours that night. We stayed in that leadership meeting five hours that night. And I just went through everything that I'd written down. And I laid it out for them. And at the end of that time, one of the leaders said, James, let's do it here. Let's do it here. I didn't expect that. They all unanimously said, yes, let's do it here. Because you see, everything I'd said, couldn't, you can't argue with it biblically. Okay, you can't argue with this biblically. And, so, and they were men of the word, and they understood, yes, yes, this is in line with the heart of Jesus, and this is in line with the word of God. We're not going to argue with that. So James, why go do it somewhere else? Let's do it here. But I knew intuitively that theory and practice are two different things. That when we started the practice of the changes that were going to have to happen, chaos was going to exude. Because when you bring change, people do mean things. And they really do. And so I said to them, our leadership team, I said, I will do this here under one condition, that all of you will promise me you will make the transition. Because the survival of the church will depend on its leadership staying intact because we are about to enter into some tough, tough waters. People are are not going to respond well to change. They just don't do it. No matter whether it's right or wrong, they don't care. If it upsets their apple cart, they're going to do some mean things. And I knew that was going to happen. And they all agreed, yes, we will stay. And they did. They did. So what I did is I brought the church together on Sunday nights. And I taught for four weeks on these concepts. And the church embraced it. They embraced it wholeheartedly. And then we began to implement change. And all hell broke loose in our church once again. <laughs> People went, whoa, whoa, now wait a minute, this doesn't feel like church anymore, this doesn't, what is going on here? I had, I had people that honestly, I had people that called me names, vulgar names. Uh, I had people that wrote me nasty letters, stopped short of death threats, didn't have any death threats, but I did have people that I had personally led to Christ a disciple, looked me in the eye and said, James, you are crazy. And I said, no, I'm not crazy. I've been crazy. I know what crazy looks like. <laughs> but if, if you can't handle this, I understand. God bless you. There's another church down the road that you can, you can, you know, you can go to. And I love you. And, and I'm not angry with you. But God bless you. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Okay? And we started this thing. And the church 
just kept going down. It kept going down. And, and one of the leaders came to me one time and, and he said, James, I thought you said God was going to bless us when we did this. And I said, I think he is. But I said, if he closes the door of this place, you and I are going to be the ones that lock it because you promised me you'd be here. Yeah. And, he, and he did. Uh, we came to a place, and I can't remember exactly when it was. It was a period of time when it was like one Sunday. It was like the Lord said, okay, now it's time to go to work. And he started bringing people in here. And they started seeing what we're doing. They started catching the spirit in the atmosphere. And, and people that were coming in were going, they were saying things like, wow, uh, I've never been in a church like this. I've never experienced anything like this. And, and we were in the early stages, of not anywhere near what we're doing now. But it was just the beginning part. But there was a different spirit. There was a different atmosphere in the place. And, and so some of our members that were hanging on by their fingernails going, man, I don't know if I can ride this boat or not, started hearing people say that and started thinking, well, well, maybe it's not so crazy. Maybe, maybe he's not so off his rocker. And, and, and that was 20 years ago. That was in 1992. The spring of 1992. So we're coming up here almost 20 years, the spring of 2012. And the rest is history, as it were, of what God has taught us and what has happened. We've made a lot of mistakes and we've had a lot of failures. We've had a lot of victories. And God has done some good things. We've learned a whole lot. Now, that's how we got here, okay? And that's how I even came to writing the books and, and teaching the workshops and all of that. It, it flows out of that personal experience of coming to the end of myself, coming to that place of brokenness, and being rebuilt and out of my own personal rebuilding process. And by the way, I had not even yet started experiencing the emotional healing that I needed. I've been doing that for 20 years. But what I had for the period of time was a new hope because God gave me a new vision. And that was enough to lift me up for a period of time, to get me over this hump so that I could eventually begin to do the work I needed to do to experience the internal healing that was going to be long term. And we're going to talk about that this weekend. But when all of this healing actually did begin to happen in my life, there were two questions. And this is going to form the, the core of what I want to share with you in this first session. There were two questions that I had to have answers to. And so I went to the Lord and I asked these two questions and I went to his word to find the answers. The first question was this. Why didn't God deliver me when I was crying out to him and doing the Christian disciplines more than I ever had in my life? I needed to know the answer because as a pastor, that was the answer I had given a lot of people through the years. It was the only one I knew. You know, well, okay, if you're struggling, what do you do? You give more, pray more, study more, serve more. You do more. You do the Christian, love Jesus more, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out, <laughs> you know? Or I sent them off to a counselor somewhere, you know? And, and so here I was in that situation. I love Jesus. I'd been doing the Christian disciplines, and he let me die. Nearly. And I needed an answer to that. Why did that happen? And the answer came when I got into the process that eventually has been the mechanism that God has used to bring the emotional healing that I needed. And I got into the biblical 12-step process. Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps, uh, those are biblical principles. And uh, so what I did is I went to an older man in my church, a man who had actually come to faith in Christ where we were still meeting over in the school building when I was in the dark days. Uh, he had retired from General Motors. He was a desperate alcoholic. He went into treatment, got sober, came to our church and got saved. He still practiced his recovery out there in the community and he was practicing taking in the word in our church. And I watched this man as his life began to, he began to repair the broken relationships with his kids and his family uh, that couldn't stand him because of his years of, of, you know, a depraved lifestyle, his alcoholism, like my dad had lived. And I began to watch what God was doing. And I knew this guy had something. He had, he had something that I didn't have. And so I asked, he's 80 years old now. He's 80 years old. I asked him if he would spend some time with me and take me through this process. So we got a, uh, a biblically based 12-step workbook that he had used called the Spiritual Journey Workbook. And we began meeting together, he and I, every week. And he was taking me through the process that he went through to get sober and to maintain his sobriety. So we came to step one. And step one says we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. Well, I immediately recognized that's a biblical principle, not the word about alcohol, but admitting powerlessness. That's the first beatitude where Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Where Jesus is basically saying, well, blessed are you when you admit you're powerless. Blessed are you when you admit you have nothing. 
You have nothing to present yourself as righteous before me. You have nothing to offer me in your flesh. You have nothing good that dwells within your flesh. And he says, blessed are you when you admit that for what? Then you get everything. Then you get the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven only comes to those who admit they don't deserve it. They can't earn it. They don't have anything to offer to God. And so Jesus, this is the first step. You've got to admit your brokenness. You have to admit your powerlessness. And so I go, okay, I get that. I understand that. I don't know if I'm sure I'm ready to do it, but, but I understand it's a biblical, godly principle. We came to the second step. The second step says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Okay, I'm getting that. Okay, it's pointing us to God. It's pointing us to the one that started this. It's pointing us to the Creator. I don't have a problem with that, okay? And, and so I come to the first question in this workbook under that second step because there's questions you have to ask and, and you have to answer. And here's what the question asks. List some experiences that caused you to lose faith in God. Now, I looked at that question and I thought, I'm a little offended by that question, quite frankly. I, you know, I am a pastor. I'm a professional Christian, you know. You know, and you're wanting me to list experiences that caused me to lose faith in God. I never lost faith in God. I'm a pastor. I love Jesus. So I was a little offended by that question. I, I didn't know how to answer it. And so, so here's what I wrote. I've, I've, I'm going to read it to you verbatim. I still have the workbook. In the early 90s, I was praying and seeking God with everything that was in me. But I continued to spiral down. This is what I wrote. I didn't lose faith, but I was hurt. And that was all I could think of at the time. So we went through the process. It took us about six months. We went on through all the way to step 12. And I was beginning to get some stuff here. I was beginning to, okay, this is, there's some good stuff here that's happening in me. I'm seeing some things. I'm learning some things about myself and, and experiencing some things. So I asked him at the end of that, I said, Chuck, let's do this again. Let's start back with step one and let's do this again. And so we did. So we just started right back at step one. I went through step one, admitted powerlessness, and I'm, I'm understanding that a little bit more by this time because you know I've, I've kind of gone through it. I came to step two again. Question one. Here's that pesky question again. And I read my answer that I'd written six months before, and I went, that's a crock of baloney right there, what I wrote. That is so untrue. Because by this time, having gone through the rest of the process, I realized I had been mad at God. I just hadn't been willing to admit it. And I was mad at God because when I cried out to Him, He didn't deliver me. He nearly let me die. So I knew that. I'd come to enough clarity to understand that. But I still didn't know what the answer to this question was. And I still didn't know what to write. So I did something that I've told people to do since then when they do these, this process that we're talking about this weekend, this freedom group process that we use here in the hospital church. If when you don't know what to write, you put your pen to the paper and you ask the Holy Spirit to guide your pen. And just trust Him that He will. So that's what I did. I put my pen down and this is what I wrote. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. I had to write it over in the side because I'd taken up the line with the first crock of baloney answer here, okay? And so, and here's what I wrote verbatim. I have since come to understand that God wasn't ignoring me or rejecting me. I was still trying to get through it in my own power without humbling myself before others. And then I wrote this statement. This is what hit me like a, a sledgehammer between the eyes. Sometimes our reaching out to God is not an expression of faith, but it is an expression of our pride. We don't want to humble ourselves before others, so we try to fix it in secret, just between God and us. And when I read that, I thought, that has to be from God, because I didn't know that. That's not knowledge that I had. It hit me like a bucket of cold water right between the eyes, and immediately the Holy Spirit was saying to me, James, Everything that you were doing back during that time that you were calling faith, all of that prayer, all that scripture memory, you were calling that faith, God was saying, no, son, that's pride. That's not faith. That's pride. And it wasn't that my Heavenly Father didn't want to deliver me. It wasn't that He didn't want to help me. It was that He couldn't because if He had, He would have been encouraging me in my pride and He's too good a Father to do that. And He won't do that. Because James 4, 6 says it this way, God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. 
And, 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 and what, I'm, what I came to understand, and I'm still coming to understand, it is only when we step out of our pride into brokenness that grace can begin to flow. And as long as we walk in our pride, we can't be in the flow of grace. And, and I was walking in my pride because, you see, I was doing all that stuff because I didn't want other people to hear what was going on inside of me. I didn't want to humble myself before other people. And, and I just said, God, you just got to fix me so that I don't have to talk about this. People don't ever have to know about all of this pain and all this stuff that's going on inside of me. You just got to fix me so I can go on and be a good pastor. And God said, I can't do that. Because you're coming to me in your pride. And let me tell you, that has, been a, that has been a revelation that God has continued to use in my life. And, and it opened up some other things. I said, okay, so what does that look like? Well, I immediately went to the one another passages of the New Testament. How many of them? 25, 26, 27, love one another, pray one another, uh, bear one another's burdens, exhort one another, uh, you know, encourage one another, all these one another's. Well, what's that all about? Uh, confess your sins to one another, James, you know, chapter 5. What is that? Well, that means you've got to humble yourself to one another. You know? I mean, you can't do the Christian life in isolation. You can only do the Christian life in community. It's all the one another stuff. And I didn't want to do any of those one another's. I wanted God to fix me because I didn't want to humble myself to one another's. And it was when I got into this one another process with this man... And began to, he be, began to confess that the healing began to happen because I began to step out of my pride into my brokenness and grace then began to flow in my life. And you see, there's the key. When, as long as we're doing image management, we cannot walk in grace. We're walking in pride. And as long as there is this subtext, as long as the church is not a safe place, see... For people to tell their secrets, then everybody's going to be doing image management, walking in their pride, and grace is not free to flow. Because God opposes us in our pride, and He gives grace to the humble. We say around here about secrets. Secrets make us sick. You're as sick as your secrets. Let me tell you another thing secrets do. Secrets put bullets in the enemy's gun to shoot you with. When you keep secrets... You load his gun, and he'll shoot you with it. He'll create fear. He'll create shame. He creates all those things that kill us. Now, we have an illustration here, around here that we use of safety, uh, the hospital gown. Who designed the hospital gown? You know, some pervert <laughs> or whatever. You know that thing. You know, it's open in the back, and you got the tie strings, you know? You, you know. And you know when you first go to the hospital, after two or three days in the hospital, you have no dignity left. Okay, because they've poked you and they've prodded you in every part of your body. And, but when you first go in the hospital, you put that thing on and you tie it, overlap it real good and tie it in the back. Because you don't want anybody seeing what you got. Right? And, and so, you're, you know, you're very careful. But after two or three days, you don't care. Yeah, I mean, they've seen everything. You've been poked and prodded. So, you know, you're walking up down the hall and you got the thing open, you know. And, I mean, it's just all hanging out there. In other words, you're not trying to cover anything up anymore, Right? That's a picture of what the church ought to be like. You see, that's a picture of the safety of the church where we ought to be able to put on our hospital gown and just leave the back open and just not be worried about it. You understand that's a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, we don't all want to go to jail. Uh, but that picture has really been wonderful for us to keep this in front of us here at the hospital church that if we are in a hospital, we're all wearing hospital gowns. And that thing wasn't designed to conceal. It was designed for easy access so that the professionals can have easy access to any part of the body they need to get to to incorporate the healing process. And when we cover up and we tie up, we prevent the healing process. We have to be open with one another. So I had my answer. That's why the Father did not intervene and save me then because I was in my pride and He wanted me in my brokenness. The second question I had was, why was it that as I began to experience emotional healing that not only did my spiritual connection to the Father get better, but all of my relationships got better? Now, here's the question. Why is it that when I began to experience this emotional healing that began to take place, I moved into a deeper intimacy with the Father as I moved into deeper intimacy with people? Now, I grappled with that. Why is that? So I went to His Word. Because I believe all truth is God's truth. 
I knew there had to be an answer in the Word if this was true. And so I discovered in the Word what I've come to, to call the emotional spiritual principle. It's a part of my refuge book. It's part of the workbook. It, it forms one of the core values of everything we do in the hospital church, the emotional spiritual principle. Now let me give you the principle, and then we'll talk about it, and then this, this part of the workshop will be over with. The emotional spiritual principle says it this way. You can never be more spiritually mature than you are emotionally mature. I'll say that again. The spiritual principle, the emotional spiritual principle, you can never be more spiritually mature than you are emotionally mature. And that means, quite frankly, that your emotional maturity will always form a ceiling to your spiritual maturity. Another way of saying it is that your relationship to the Father will never go beyond your relationships to other people. Okay, because where this stops in this ceiling with your ability to have intimate relationship with people, your, your relationship to the Father in intimacy will never go beyond that. That is a biblical principle that I began to come to understand. Now, I know it sounds controversial because we flip it around typically. We say, well, if I want to get closer to people, I just need to get closer to God. And God's Word says exact opposite of that. Exact opposite. It sounds spiritual to say that. I'm just going to love God more, and that will help me to love people more. But God says, no, the reality is you can't love me more than you're capable of loving people. He flips it around. And, and I have people all the time that go, well, where does the Bible say that? Well, once I began to understand it, I started seeing it on every page of the New Testament. And, and what the spiritual principle means is that God does not compartmentalize our relationship with Him from our relationships with people. They are intimately connected in the heart of God in what He intends and how He connected us and how He created us. So let me define a few terms, okay, here. We need to define some terms so you can understand this principle de on a deeper level. What is spiritual maturity, okay? Spiritual maturity, because that's what we're after, right? Ultimately, we want to be intimate with the Father, okay? Spiritual maturity, well, it is, spiritual maturity is an enlarged capacity. Well, anything that matures enlarges in its capacity, right? My little granddaughter that was born just an hour and a half ago, by the grace of God, a little bitty thing, she's not going to stay little. She's going to mature, right? And as she matures, what happens? She's going to grow. She's going to increase in size and capacity. So anything that matures from an acorn to an oak tree, it increases in its capacity. Okay, so what we're looking for here is increased spiritual capacity, right? Okay, increased capacity for an intimate relationship with the Father. That's what spiritual maturity is. Spiritual maturity is not doing the Christian disciplines. It is having an intimate relationship with the Father because the Father didn't create us for the Christian disciplines. He created us for a relationship. Now, if the disciplines... If the disciplines contribute to that, then they're wonderful, and that's what they're for. But they themselves are not maturity. Maturity, spiritual maturity, is an enlarged, increased capacity for an intimate relationship with the Father. Now, that's spiritual maturity. So what is emotional maturity? Well, emotional maturity is an enlarged capacity for intimacy with people. Because God created us for both relationships, didn't He? He created us for relationship with Him and who else? Each other. He created us for both of these. So as we increase in spiritual maturity, then we are increasing, enlarging in our capacity for intimacy with Him. And as we increase in emotional maturity, we are enlarging our capacity for intimate relationships with other people. Now, remember... You can never be more spiritually mature than you are emotionally mature. So this one is just as important as this one because this one is going to limit our capacity. Now, what is it then that causes emotional immaturity? It is emotional woundedness. And we all get wounded in life. We've all been wounded by the fall. We've all been wounded by our own sinful choices. You, you've done things that, that hurt you. You said you've, you've made choices. We've been wounded by the sinful choices of others against us. And when that happens, it creates a, an emotional wound, okay? From our sin, other sins against us, the fact that we live in a fallen world where horrible things happen. And when those wounds happen, they create emotional stagnation. They create emotional blocks. 
Emotional development gets stagnated. Uh, you know, like, like a 12-year-old has a limited amount of capacity for intimate relationships, right? We have a lot of folks that are running around 50 years old biologically, but they're still 12 years old emotionally because of emotional woundedness that's never been dealt with, and so they're limiting their capacity for intimate relationships with others. Now, why is that? Well, what are the things that result when you are hurt, when you are wounded emotionally? Things like anger, fear, mistrust, resentment. I mean, when, if someone's hurt you, the tendency is for that to create anger, isn't it? Maybe resentment. Maybe unforgiveness. You know, I, I, I'll never forgive that person. You know? Well, what do these do? What do these things do that are the result of emotional wounds? Well, they cause us to hold people off. You know? Because, man, I've been hurt before, and <laughs> no, no, it ain't happening again. You know? I mean, like, my elbow's only been this far. That's as close as I'm letting you get, because I let you get too much closer, you'll get me. Okay, and I'm not about to let you get that close to me because I've been hurt before. Fool me once, you know, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And we call it the Heisman pose around here. You know the Heisman Trophy, the number one college player? What's he doing? He's holding the ball here. What's he doing with his arm? It's a classic stiff arm. Man, I perfected the stiff arm move in my life because I was such a wounded person and, and such a survivor. It was like, hey, man, it's me against the world, and, it, you know, you, you, you root hard or die. You know, and I perfected these elbows that would not bend any more than this. But, but think about this. How did God cr create us and what did He intend us for with one another? He intended us for elbows that bend all the way. So we get next to each other. So we get intimate with one another. So we can move into soul-to-soul -soul relationships. But because of emotional woundedness that has never been dealt with, all of these issues that separate us and hold one another off, like anger and fear and bitterness and resentment and all that stuff, it creates this block. Now, now get this, okay? What does the New Testament call things like anger, bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness? It's a three-letter word. It starts with S. Sin. What does sin do to the Holy Spirit? Grieves and quenches. How do we commune with Him who is spirit? Because Jesus said God is spirit, and those that worship Him must how? Worship Him in spirit and in truth. And how do we have intimacy with the Father who is spirit? With spirit. But if spirit is is grieved and quenched because of the results of unresolved emotional issues. What's happening here? My capacity for that communion, that spiritual communion with the Father is quenched and grieved by this. You see, there is this connection, this emotional spiritual connection. God says you can't have a deeper intimacy with me than you are capable of having with other people. It's this vertical and horizontal thing that in the economy of God are intimately linked together. Now, we need to go to the scripture for a moment. And, and, and we've talked about the principle. I, I hope you understand it. Now, where is this in the Bible? Okay, so let me just give you a few instances. We don't have time to do them all. Matthew 5, 7. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful because what? They shall obtain mercy they shall receive mercy now see now what's he talking about okay god to some extent is going to limit our capacity to experience his mercy to what extent to the extent that we extend it to other people jesus said in matthew 5 23 through 24 if you're at the altar presenting your offering and you remember what that your brother here this broken relationship what are you supposed to do jesus said well, go ahead and finish your worship and then go take care of that when you got time. No, that's not what he said. Stop your worship. Go get that right. And then you come back here. You see, there's this mindset in the Father. What are you doing here when this is that? You know, leave this. Get that right and then I'll be able to receive this. Matthew 6, verse 12 in the model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's the model prayer. Jesus said pray like this. What did he say about forgiveness? He said, forgive us as we forgive others. Now that word as is a big word, isn't it? If I really pray that way with that spirit, what I'm asking God to do is I'm asking God to limit my experience of the fullness of His forgiveness to the level I've given it away. I'm saying, God, you forgive me just as I've forgiven others. Well, what if I haven't forgiven others? 
I'm asking the Father, Lord, limit the fullness that I experience of your forgiveness to the level I've given away. In fact, Jesus told two or three parables that that's exactly what the Father does. <laughs> you know, when the king forgave the servant this unpardonable, this unpayable debt, and then that servant went out and dunned his buddy for a few pennies, the king says, you wicked servant. Look what I forgave you, and you wouldn't give... And, and you know, the king was hacked to the limit. And Jesus then said, so also will your heavenly Father not forgive you who is in heaven. So this principle is, he said, look, you can't come and, and, experience, and expect to walk in the fullness of the freedom and the release of my forgiveness if you're not giving it away. I'm, it's going to be limited. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where Paul is, you know, kind of chiding the Corinthians because they're a bunch of spiritual babies. He says, man, you, you ought to be eating meat by now and you're still on the milk. And, and, and he said, and then you know why, how he said he knew that? He said, because is there not still jealousy and division and backbiting among you? He looked at how they related to one another. He said, you're a bunch of spiritual babies. Because spiritual babies don't relate to one another. Our spiritual mature people don't relate to one another like that. He said, here you are. This is how I know that you're not intimate with the Father, that you're not at a spiritual maturity because you're a bunch of emotional babies. All this bitterness and all this, you don't know how to get along. You don't know how to have intimacy. And that indicates to me that you're still spiritual babies with the Father. I love 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Most husbands hate it. Uh, it says, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker visual, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, lest your prayers be hindered. He said, husband, now you don't relate to your wife the way I want you to, uh, I'm not going to hear. You're talking to me, I'm going, I don't hear you. Why? Well, because you're treating my daughter badly, that's why. You know, so he said, you know, there's a limitation here, man. You're, you don't come to me with all this flowery prayer and you're not granting her honor as a fellow heir of the grace? No, no, we're not going there. You see, this connection, this vertical horizontal connection, in 1 John 4, 20, where he says, how can you say you love God whom you cannot see and you hate your brother whom you do? You can't. <laughs> God says, no, you can't be loving me and hating your brother. No. You can't be more intimate with me than you can with other. So do you get the point? I mean, it's so clear through the New Testament as you begin to see. God never separates our relationship with Him from our relationship with people. Now, we love to do that as Christians. We love, oh, man, I can love Jesus with everything in me, but I can hate my brother. And God may not like it, but it doesn't affect this. Well, God says, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because these are two are connected. Now, now, here's the deal. Here's the problem. And I've got about 12 minutes that I have to finish this session. Here's one of the problems in the church is we've talked a whole lot in the church about spiritual maturity, we've talked none about emotional maturity historically. And so everybody's on this track. Let's get close to Jesus. And that's right, we want to. But in order to do that, we better deal with the blocks that are keeping us from getting there. And so what we typically do, we talk about spiritual things and we leave emotional things to the counselors. And that is a cop-out. That is a cop-out. Because if our job is to raise up mature Christ followers, we better be dealing with everything in their life that is preventing right. that maturity from taking place. But for that to happen, the church has to first of all become a safe place for people to tell those secrets, for people to tell about those abuses, for people to tell about those anger and that bitterness and resentment that they have that maybe they've never told anybody. And if the church is not a safe place, then people aren't going to talk about it. And if they don't talk about it, they can't get help. You see, I believe we have all the tools for full and complete spiritual and emotional healing right here. You know what we have? We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the perfect Word of God. And we have the body of Jesus. What more do we need? What more do we need? The church needs to be a hospital. Now, so the church has to be a safe place to, for people to tell their secrets. We got that, right? The second thing the church has to have is a safe process for people to experience emotional and spiritual healing. Safe place, safe process. One of them is not enough. Because if the church is just a safe place, well, then people will talk about their pain, but they won't get past it. Right? 
if the church has a safe process that people can enter for healing, but the church is not a safe place, people won't access the process. Because they don't want no people they're me don't want people knowing they're messed up. But if the church is a safe place that says it's okay, we're not going to look down on you, we're not going to think you don't love Jesus. If you're struggling in your marriage or if you're dealing with some hurt from your past, maybe you were sexually abused or maybe you were abandoned or whatever, it's okay, it's okay, you can admit that. And then the church says, not only that, but we have a safe process here that you can move into. It's a biblical process where healing can begin to take place. And what happens? The ceiling gets raised here. And guess what happens to this? See, we have people that come into the hospital church all the time who say, you know what? I've been a Christian for 30 years. I've been in church 30 years. And I've been in this church maybe a year or two. And I've grown more in my walk with Christ in one year here than I did in all 30 years put together. What happened? And I said, well, you just raised the ceiling. That's all you did. Because they, they, they saw this was a safe place. And so they started saying, well, you know, I've got some things going on here that I've never talked about. And so we put them in the freedom group process, this one new, another process that's built around the Word and, and community and all the one another's. And they start getting to tell those secrets. And, and they start the Holy Spirit starts really revealing things. And they begin to experience healing in that environment and what happens is two things as emotional healing begins to take place marriage gets better because elbows start bending and marriage is meant to be a relationship like this wasn't it and relationships at work they get better because you're not you're not so afraid you're not so full of anger anymore you, you've released that bitterness and you know you're just feeling better and and all of a sudden just all this stuff gets better and then you go to church and you read the Word and all of a sudden the Word means more and, and the worship means more and, and, and all of a sudden you, you, you just, you're walking in a new renewed experience of the intimacy of God. And How did this happen? You raised the ceiling. You got the blocks out of the way. You started forgiving like I wanted you to and you learned what that meant and, and, and you started releasing that anger and you saw that wasn't doing you any good and, 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 and so you did it and, 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 and praise God. And so now, man, come to the altar and let's have a good time together. Are y'all are getting this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. This is the, this is the kind of the core of the, of the workshop, this right here. You got to get the picture of the church. This is the picture God began to give me in that week in the library. That the church was a place, it had to be a place, where people could get the real help. And in America, sadly enough, and I don't believe it's true of the church all around the world, because I've been in the church in places around the world, and I've seen that it's not true in places. But in America, we're more concerned about being a community of respectability than we are about being a hospital. And I don't think our Savior Jesus came to establish a community of respectability. I think He came to build a hospital where the great physician can do His work. And therein lies the problem. We have to change how we see the church. What is the church? What should the church look like? Do we just want to be a community of respectable looking people? Then all we got to do is put on our nice clothes, drive our nice cars to our nice buildings, preach our nice sermons, sing our nice worship songs, and go on and stay in our pain. And we'll look good. And we will look like a community of respectability. But we won't be the church of Jesus. Because the church of Jesus is a hospital and my daughter is a pediatric trauma nurse practitioner in a major children's hospital and she deals with the blood and guts of hurting children when they've gone through the windshield of the car because they weren't strapped in or they were bit snake, bitten by a snake or they had neurological problems and she sees the blood and the guts and the gore and where do they take those children? They don't take them to the country club. They take them to the hospital because that's where the help is because the people that care and are trained are there to bring the help and they bring them to the hospital and they minister to those children and they get help, hope, and healing. And the question is, where do people go when they hurt? They usually don't come to the church. They come to the church to look respectable because the church is not a safe place to really talk about the blood and the guts of the reality of what's going on in your marriage, really, at home. You look good on Sunday, but what's happening during the week? or what's really going on inside here, or what really happened to you when you were 13 or 14 years old that you've never told anybody, that has devastated your life and created shame and all those kinds of things. So Refuge, my first book, is about the church being a safe place. It's about how to create the safe place. 
That's what the safe place looks like. What does the church, what is the vision of the church? The ABCs of Life Change Workbook, the individual as well as the couples, is about the safe process. When someone says, you know what, I'm willing to tell the truth about the pain, we go, we go immediately, okay, good, that's a good place to be. Because now we're going to put you into this process that is a God-honoring, Christ-honoring, biblically-based process where you can begin to move beyond that hurt and raise that ceiling. And this is going to get better. And this is going to get better. And people go on and move toward the abundant life of Jesus. That's what it is. It's a safe place. It's a safe process. That's what a hospital is. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you that you are our healer, our great physician. You not only healed us spiritually by your death and your burial and your resurrection and your perfect shed blood for our sin, but Lord, that you desire to bring healing of the wounds of this life that we've all experienced in order that we might be released into deeper intimacy, yes, with one another and ultimately with you. And that is our hope and that is our prayer and that is our desire. I pray, Father, that you build a church in America and around this globe that sees who we are as that kind of place. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.